Um, if you're watching at home and you have young kids, uh, you may want to have them check out for a couple minutes because I'm going to tell you a story that's a little bit um, scary if you're sensitive. Uh, in 1974, Miami was shocked to hear of a 10-year-old boy's improbable survival. On the last day of school before Christmas break, 10-year-old Chris Carrier was walking home from school when he was kidnapped, stabbed, and then shot in the head and left for dead. For six days, Chris lied there, alive but unconscious. On the seventh day, Chris woke up and he stumbled upon a farmer. The farmer helped him. Amazingly, Chris survived. And this was all over the South Florida newspapers at the time. 22 years later, so that's now 1996, Chris's kidnapper confessed. By that point, the statute of limitations had run out, so the man, David McAllister, couldn't be charged for the crime. At this point, Mr. McAllister was an old man. He was blind. He was living in a nursing home. And when Chris heard about his kidnapper's confession, he went to the nursing home and he paid him a visit. When he got there, old Mr. McAllister confessed to what he had done. And then Chris forgave him. Chris said, quote, he said he was sorry. And I told him I forgave him and that from now on, there would be nothing like anger or revenge between us, nothing except a new friendship. Those weren't just words for Chris. From that day forward, Chris would come back to that nursing home to visit with Mr. McAllister, a guy who had no family or friends visiting him. His only visitor is the man he had tried to kidnap and kill. And yet Chris would come every day. He would read Mr. McAllister the Bible. They would pray together. Some days Chris would even bring Mr. McAllister his favorite food, smoked fish. And in time, the two actually did become friends. Until one day when Mr. McAllister finally passed away. Newspapers, of course, picked up on the story. And they interviewed Chris. And they asked him, why he would go out of his way to forgive this man and then care for him. He told those newspapers it was because of his faith in Jesus Christ. His faith enabled him to forgive Mr. McAllister and to move on with his life years before that. His faith had led him to become a youth pastor. And now, at that point, his faith was leading him to take care of this old, dying man. All right, the, the scary stuff is over. The point is this. Jesus is able to restore even the most shattered relationship you can imagine. Jesus is able to reconcile even bitter enemies. He is, after all, the Prince of Peace the ultimate peacemaker. And even today, Jesus is at work turning foes into family. Today we're going to see how by his power, we ourselves can follow in his footsteps and become peacemakers ourselves. So let me pray for us before we get into God's word. Heavenly Father, we come in need of your insight, as we always do. We come wanting to understand this power that let Chris forgive, this power that now dwells within your people. We pray that you'd help us to see the peacemaking work of Jesus Christ and to understand how that should come to bear on how we live as his followers. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In this uh, morning's passage, we're going to see how Jesus turns foes into family by becoming two 
main obstacles. The first obstacle Jesus needs to overcome to turn foes into family is our history of separation, our history of separation. You see, oftentimes when you see someone who is quite different from you, you don't feel particularly drawn to that person. At the same time, you do feel drawn to people who are like you. We all know it's easier to talk with people who are like you, who share your values, who look like you. It feels natural to hang out. It just doesn't feel as natural to be with someone and to talk with someone who's pretty different than you. It makes it feel kind of uncomfortable sometimes even just to have a conversation with them. It's just not as pleasant as, as having the easy road and being with people like you. And so what happens is in the wake of differences around us, we tend to hang out with people like ourselves. And the people who are different, we just don't particularly pursue them. We don't start up a conversation with them. We don't start a relationship with them. We just kind of ignore them. And that then becomes the pattern for how we interact with that person or how we don't interact. It's not that we hate that person or have anything against them necessarily. It's honestly that well, we just don't like them, or we don't think we're going to like them as much as we like the people that are like us. We just don't particularly care to talk to them. So we think, I'm sure that person is fine. They must have a community that cares for them. It's okay. Or if that person comes in, say someone comes in through the back doors and they look like somebody in need, we might think, oh, man, that person seems like they're in need, but I'm sure someone here is going to reach out to them. You know, I'm just so busy with what I have going on. I have a lot of people in my life and stuff. I'm sure somebody's going to take care of me. That's called indifference. Indifference is not hatred, but it is also not love. It is a posture that we're taking towards someone, and it's going to influence how that person then perceives us, how we're treating them. If you feel like someone can see you, but they don't value you, not enough to talk to you or to include you in things, that hurts. And over time, this sense that you are someone who is unseen, unloved, unwanted, it can lead to bitterness, and it can lead you to move further away from that person, maybe to leave the community itself where they are there. This kind of indifference is all over our world. It keeps people disconnected from each other. And it is, for many of us, a quiet source of pain in our life, especially for those of us who are on the margins of society in some way, people who are, on average, more needy and less supported than the average person. People on the margins especially need our support. They especially need help. Even if it's just friends and community that they need for whatever reason. And yet our indifference to them keeps us away from them. And that's why indifference has no place in the church. Love your enemy does not simply mean don't hate your enemy or don't hate your neighbor. It means love your enemy, love your neighbor. And here as always, Jesus is the one who sets the example for us to follow. Jesus is someone who embraced outsiders, even when it came at a cost to him. You see this in the gospels as Jesus is walking around, he sees Zacchaeus, the hated tax collector, he says, Zacchaeus, I'm going over to your house for dinner. Now, Zacchaeus, he was universally hated and despised by his own people. He was on the margins because he was taking advantage of people, and people really resented that. So he had put himself on the margins, right? It was his own fault at some level. I mean, people were just, you know, they, didn't, they really hated Zacchaeus. So the fact that Jesus would come and associate himself with Zacchaeus and say, hey, we're going to hang out tonight. It made everybody think, Jesus, man, what is wrong with you? Don't you understand what kind of a man Zacchaeus is? 
But when Jesus saw Zacchaeus, he didn't join everybody in condemning Zacchaeus. He moved towards Zacchaeus, and he initiated a relationship with him. And this is the same kind of thing Jesus is doing now. Jesus is, physically speaking, in heaven, but Jesus is not just hanging out. Jesus is at work in our world right now. Jesus is on a mission that he's working out through his spirit to embrace people of all nations, even people who are so often excluded by others because they're different in some way. So look at Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 13 this morning. Paul says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Paul tells his Christian brothers and sisters, you were far off. You were outsiders. You were different. But Jesus has come to you, and he has brought you near. He has come and embraced you, even though you are not like Jesus. Every Christian shares this story at some level. When it comes to the Trinitarian community, we are all outsiders looking in. We are not like God. We are quite different from God. But God is not indifferent to us. God loves us. So he doesn't just ignore us because we're different and say, oh, I'm so happy with God. Who cares about those people? No, God sees us. He sees our need. And he comes to us. He comes to us so completely that he actually becomes like us. And he does this, ultimately, so he can embrace us. So we who were far off because of our sin might be drawn into God's community and live in fellowship with him. Jesus is so godly, we are so ungodly, but we still matter to him. Couldn't be more different. We matter so much to Jesus that he not only came to us, but he gave up everything to come to us. He gave up everything to embrace us. He gave up everything so he could live in a relationship with us and then care for us as our shepherd. But while all of that is true and wonderful and foundational to our life as Christians, the point Paul is making here is just a bit different than that. Paul is actually applying this good news to the particular situation of his readers. He's writing to Gentile Christians. Now, if you don't know, everyone, according, you know, in terms of how the Bible frames people, everybody's either a Jew or a Gentile. Historically, Jews and Gentiles have not gotten along. They've kept their distance from each other, these communities. The Jews worshiped the living God, and one way that they tried to worship God was by staying away from sin and from the people who are committed to sin. Because of this, Gentiles were in many ways excluded from the Jewish community. They were excluded from the people of God. They were far off. Take a look at verses 11 and 12 and see what Paul describes and what he means when he talks about us being far off, he says, therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made, by the, made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So the Jews, they were God's chosen people, and they took pride in that. They took pride in the fact that they had the relationship with God, and other nations didn't. That they had God's law, and God had given his law to other people. They took pride in these things that had set them apart. They took pride in the practice of circumcision. This was a sign, according to the covenant they had with God, that every Israelite was supposed to make. Every Israelite male was supposed to be circumcised as a member of God's people. So they felt like we are different, we are better than those people, because we are God's people. And so to the Jews, everybody else was the uncircumcision. And they treated those people accordingly. Now, let me tell you, 
How would you like to be called the uncircumcision? How would you like that to be the label that people give to you? You can tell it's got a condescending feel to it. Now imagine that you are a Gentile living in a community where there are observant Jews around you. They're ethnically different from you. You look different, you guys act different. Whenever Jewish people see you, they separate themselves from you because they think you're unclean. They believe that they're saved and you're not, that they're God's special people and you're not. How do you feel? You're going to feel some bitterness and resentment toward them. It hurts to be excluded. You might not be enemies or having fights and stuff, but you're certainly not friends. You're neighbors, but that's even a stretch, you're more like strangers. And the fact that Israel was God's chosen nation only made the situation worse for Gentiles. But now, because of that, they weren't just far off from Israel. They were far off from Israel's God. They were far off from Israel's Messiah. They were godless. And because they were godless, they were hopeless. They were far off. They were lost. They were strangers. But Jesus loves strangers. Jesus is not indifferent to people who are different than he is. He is not indifferent to people on the margins and have needs. He loves those people. And he is pursuing those people. Jesus has never been indifferent to a single person. He always has a particularly strong opinion. He's never been indifferent about anything. So rather than indifference keeping Jesus back from the godless Gentiles, Jesus' love for the Gentiles propels him forward. It leads him to go to them, working by his spirit, and to bring them into a relationship with himself. That's what Jesus had done for Chris Carrier. When Chris had sinned against him, Jesus had forgiven him, gone to him, and restored a relationship with him. And so Chris felt compelled to go and forgive this man who had sinned against him and to restore a relationship with him so he might do him good. Indifference alienates us from each other. Love leads us to move toward each other and embrace one another. Love is what must conquer indifference. Coexistence is not enough. Community is our calling. Community is what we were made for. Community is what we all need. And community is what we must go and offer to others. And that's why we cannot be complacent about our feelings of indifference. And that's why we must move toward others in love. And especially toward those who are in so many ways on the outside looking in on our community. It's hard to be an outsider. I feel this every time I go to a Christian conference. There'll be thousands and thousands of people there, right? They're, in, they're all Christians. Um, but when I ever I go to a Christian conference, all these people there, I feel so lonely. I mean, I'm with thousands of people, but none of them are with me. I'm in a crowd, but I am unseen. I am ignored. I don't feel particularly valued by other people around me. It's not a community. But for a while, I went to a Congolese church where I was welcomed. Uh, in this Congolese church, the church worshipped in French, English, and Lingala. I was definitely an outsider there, the only white guy. Uh, but I was embraced. I felt seen. And not seen as a threat, but as a brother in Christ. So after the service, people would they'd have lunch together. People would come up to me, and they would invite me to sit with them. They would go out of their way to accommodate me, even without me asking. So as I'm sitting there with lunch, if somebody started speaking in French or Lingala, the person next to me would just start translating for me in English without being asked. I mean, I was an outsider, to be sure. Everybody recognized that. But I didn't feel like an outsider. I felt accepted. I felt embraced. I felt loved. And they made their love tangible to me. And so on this last Sunday with them, they gave me this bright, super bright, big African shirt. Uh, as a way to say, you know what? You're one of us. We love you. We've been happy to get to know you. It was a token of their love. And every time I see that bright 
blue shirt in my closet, I smile and I remember how warmly they welcomed me. And that's how I want everyone to feel when they walk through these doors. No matter who they are, whoever, who might come through the doors, no matter what they might look like, no matter how they might speak or act, we need to embrace them. Just as Jesus came to us when we were far off and proactively brought us near to himself. The world says, hey, let them be. If they want to become like us, so be it. If not, that's fine. Jesus says, see the stranger, go to them, embrace them as they are, welcome them, try to start a relationship with them, even if they're different from you, serve them, even if this makes other people nervous, talk with them, even if your cultural differences make talking uncomfortable, embrace the outsider because Jesus has embraced you. And Jesus doesn't just tell us to do this. He empowers us to do this because he has loved us with a powerful love. And now we are able to move others toward others in that love and embrace them with the love of Christ that has welcomed us. Jesus has given us the power to overcome our indifference and to love others by serving them and inviting them into our lives. Second obstacle Jesus overcomes for us is our wall of hostility. And in this way, Jesus paves the way for peace in his church. Take a look with me at verses 14 to 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Look, in the real world, churches have conflicts. Usually, if it's a, you know, a halfway decent church, uh, those conflicts are sort of under the surface, right? It's not like everybody just gets together and every week they come and they got their tomatoes and they just fight. You know, it's like, it's, there's conflict, but it's subtle, right? You have to be in the community to know what the conflict is, right? But what can happen is that, so you have this church, there's, there's some conflict, there's some tension, but everybody knows we've got to just pretend like everything is fine, like we all love each other, that we're all united, but we know that there, is these, there are these tensions. There is even some resentment hiding just beneath the surface. So sometimes what happens is these tensions and hurt feelings that are leading you know, people to really feel resentment, you know, they, sometimes they bubble up. Something, some, something happens, there's a confrontation. Sometimes the church, it gets so bad that the church splits. But what usually happens is that the church, it just agrees to operate under the terms of a kind of ceasefire. And what they do is they say, I'll stay with people on my side. You stay with the people on your side. And we're going to pretend like everything is okay with us. Even though these tensions have really led, in reality, to, to hurt feelings, to some anger, to some resentment and bitterness. Now, don't get me wrong. A ceasefire is better than nuclear warfare in the church. But we should not be content with a ceasefire. A ceasefire is when we don't address what really divides us. We, we don't really deal with the anger between us. Jesus is not content with a ceasefire. Jesus didn't come to bring a ceasefire. He came to bring peace to his church. Peace in the Bible is not just about the absence of warfare. It's not about the absence of conflict. The word for peace in the Old Testament is shalom. Shalom is about wholeness in every sense. Shalom is whole people living in whole and healthy community with others. The peace Jesus wants in his church and in this church is a community made whole. A community where everyone is united to one another in his love. It's not just about ending the hostility. It's ultimately about repairing and restoring broken relationships by the power of his love 
so we can become one united family in Christ, a community of shalom. To accomplish this, Jesus needs to do two things for us. First, he needs to reconcile us to God so our broken relationship with God can be restored. The reason why this world is so broken is because at some level, it's ultimately because our relationship with the living God has been broken. And so to bring peace on earth, Jesus needed to broker a peace between God and us. He needed to reconcile us to God. And so that's what he comes to do. You see this in verse 16, where Paul says, Jesus has reconciled both Jews and Gentiles to God. Both Jews and Gentiles had hostility in their relationship with God. They were separated from God because of their sin. And Jesus goes and he dies for the sins of both communities so that the sins separating them from God might be forgiven. And so they might start or restart a real relationship with God, a new and intimate relationship with God. Jesus is the peacemaking God who becomes the peace of his people. He doesn't just help us see the problem in our relationship with God, but he fixes the problem. He mends the relationship so we might be reconciled to God and enjoy the blessing of living in shalom with our creator. And then the second thing Jesus needs to do to bring peace in the church is to reconcile us then to one another. We've been reconciled to God. Now we need to be reconciled to one another. Jesus needs to deal with what's dividing us and actually address the root cause of our hostility. When differences in the church turn into divisions, anger starts to grow, bitterness, Hostility starts to set in. As I said, it might not be public hostility. It might just be a quiet resentment that you keep to yourself. But the pain, it's real. The anger is real. The impulse to hate those people is real. Even if you don't want to think that you kind of want to hate them, and even if you're trying to fight against hating them, there is this animosity, this hostility, and it impacts how we treat each other. To enjoy real peace in the church, this has to be addressed. If it's not addressed, the best we can hope for is a, a ceasefire where we all agree to pretend that all is well, but that is not good enough for Jesus. And that's why Jesus himself has addressed the walls of hostility that divide us in the church. Paul says in verse 15 that Jesus has made peace in his church. He has done something to make shalom, this kind of shalom, possible. Now, to help you understand, I need to remind you of some of the background here. Paul, as we've seen, is writing to diverse congregations where there were both Jews and Gentiles. As I said, historically, Jews and Gentiles were foes. There was bad blood between them. There was a history not only of separation, but of some hostility. So how were these Jewish Christians and these Gentile Christians in the same church coming from different ethnicities, different religious backgrounds, supposed to live together in peace. Did the Gentile Christians need to step up their religious intensity and become more like the really, you know, passionate Jewish Christians who were all about doing the law? Or is it that the Jewish Christians needed to relax and take a chill pill and become more like the Gentile Christians so they could all get along? The answer is neither one of those things. Look what Paul says in verses 14 and 15. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace. Jesus has paved the way for believers to be reconciled to one another by doing two things. First, he has broken down the wall of hostility that used to divide us. And where did that, where is that, what is that wall of hostility? Why does it exist? Well, look, in the broadest sense, it is in some way or another our differences that divide us. 
I mean, if everyone was just like you, they thought just like you, they lived just like you, they wanted exactly the same things that you want, which of course for you is for you to be happy, then there would be no problems, right? If you lived in a world where everybody wants you to happy, be happy and flourish and to have everything you want, there would be no conflict because everybody would be working for the same agenda, your agenda. But hey, that is not how life works. In real life, we're different. In real life, we all are self-interested. And so we're competing with each other. In real life, we want different things. We see things in different ways. We are different. Now this happens on an individual level. You know, I want things. And so if you get in the way of me getting something that I want, I'm gonna get angry with you and hostility can set in kind of one-to-one. -one. And it can also happen on a group level. My people want things or our congregation wants things. We have a certain way of doing things. And if you or if the Chinese congregation comes and they try to change us or stop us from that, there's gonna be trouble, right? It can happen between individuals. It can happen between groups. It comes out of our differences. But the root of our hostility, if you think about it, it's not precisely that we are different. It is that we are holding on to the things that make us different, like this. On an individual level, the, the issue isn't really that you want something different from what I want. The issue to me is really that you are getting in the way of what I want. I don't just want something, I really want that thing. I need that thing. I must have that thing. I think I deserve that thing. And so I get mad when you get in my way. You are mistreating me. It is the strength of my commitment to what is mine or the strength of our commitment to what is ours that fuels our hostility toward the people who get in our way, not precisely the differences themselves. So to put this in terms of culture, everyone, if you think about it, feels a certain duty to their culture in some way, a certain uh, affinity or solidarity with the people of their culture and to, you know, continuing the values of their culture. So people say things like, I can't turn my back on my culture. But in the church, there's going to be other people who are from a different culture. And those people are going to feel a certain kind of duty to their culture and to their people. So how can we be different from one another without our differences turning into this wall of hostility that ends up dividing us from each other? The answer is that the wall needs to come down. And that's why Jesus has come and knocked down the wall. Jesus comes to us and he releases us from our fundamental primordial allegiance to ourselves, to our culture, to our people. And he shifts our allegiance. And in this way, he removes the root cause of the hostility and he knocks down the wall. I'll give you a story to illustrate. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in Minnesota, I hated Brett Favre. And you guys probably did too, right? If you're Bears fans, everybody hates Brett Favre unless you're a Packer fan. Brett Favre was the superstar quarterback of our rival, the Green Bay Packers, and your rival too, if you're from Chicago. <clears throat> and so I, I hated Brett Favre enough that I remember as a kid, I would rejoice when Brett Favre got injured, right? <laughs> now, the root cause of my hostility toward Brett Favre was not really the fact that he played for the Packers. The root cause of my hostility was that I wanted my team to win and succeed in the league. And Brett Favre was getting in the way of my team winning and my will being done. If I did not care whether the Vikings won, like some family members I know who are not Vikings fans, then I wouldn't hate Brett Favre, right? That's what's going on here. It's a picture of what Jesus does. Jesus comes, he changes our life, and in the process, he changes what matters to us. He changes what we're living for. He makes the Vikings so much less important to me because now I see that Jesus is what really matters, not football. And in this way, he makes it possible for me to treat even a Packers fan like my brother in Christ. I thank you, Lord, that there is no one like that here. But if somebody came in, 
I would like to hope that Jesus has sanctified me enough that we could get along. <laughs> Jesus buries the hatchet. Jesus overcomes the wall of hostility, and he does it by relativizing the importance of our differences. He turns them from being ultimate things that we must commit ourselves to at any cost to things that matter, but they're not the most important things about us. For Paul's readers, the key was that Jesus had broken down the wall of the law in that church. The Jews committed themselves to the law, and the Gentiles' indifference to the law was a huge source of tension in the early church. But Jesus broke down this wall of hostility. He set Jewish believers free from the need to live under the law's authority and to defend it under all costs. And this let them associate with the Gentiles that they used to avoid. Now they were living under the authority of Christ. And this paved the way for peace, even in diverse churches. It set the stage for these old foes to be able to become family, brothers and sisters. But that's not all Jesus has done. He's done even more to bring us together in the bonds of peace. Specifically, he's done a second thing. He has made us new. Paul says in verse 15 that Jesus is creating in himself, get this, one new man in place of the two. Who are the two? Gentiles, Christians, or Gentiles, Jews, Jewish Christians, Gentile Christians. That is a deep and profound statement. Try to wrap your mind around this. Jesus has not simply made you into a new you when you became a Christian. As you, you know, kind of put your old self to death and resurrected a new you to new life in Christ. But Jesus is creating a new us. In his church, Jesus is putting the old humanity, the old human race to death in a sense. And he is replacing it with a new human race, with those, the children, you know, with his children, right? The children of Christ. Jesus hasn't just united Jews and Gentiles by breaking down the wall of hostility between them. He's also united Jews and Gentiles by transforming them into the church. So it is no longer the case that I am over here with my people, you are over there with your people. Now what's happening is that we are here as God's people. Jesus has put us on the same team, all of us in Christ. And on his team, we are learning to embrace a new way of playing the game, a new way of life. And we are now committed to helping one another and working together under our coach's instructions. Let's get back to Brett Favre. My relationship with Brett Favre radically changed the day that he decided to join my team and become my quarterback. In a day, Brett Favre went with from somebody I hated to somebody I loved. Now he was on our side. But here's the thing, the kind of reconciliation Jesus makes between us in the church is even deeper than that. Jesus doesn't reconcile you to me by having you join my team, nor does he reconcile me to you by having me join your team. Instead, he puts all of us on a new team. It's like we're drafted in an expansion draft onto a brand new team with a new coach, a new philosophy on how to play the game. And so peace comes to the church, not as you learn to become like me and my people, or as I learn to become like you, it comes as each of us learns to become like Jesus. And as we recognize that we're no longer on different teams anymore, we're family, we're on the same team. And if we're going to be successful, we need to learn to play the game together as a team. And in this way, Jesus is making it possible for his diverse church to become one family in Christ, not only has he broken my fundamental allegiance to myself and to my culture and to my preferences? But he has united me with you by giving us a shared allegiance to Jesus Christ and to our new team, the church. And in both of these ways, 
He has brought us together and made it possible for our diverse church to be united by the love of Christ into a community of shalom, even when there are still differences between us. But a possibility is not enough. Jesus doesn't just want to make this possible. He wants to make this happen. The great peacemaker wants us to make peace with each other so we can enjoy the shalom that he died to broker and start playing the game together as a team. A ceasefire is not enough. Jesus wants peace. He wants us to become one tight-knit community, one family, one team, not by eliminating or ignoring our differences, but by transcending our differences with an even more powerful commitment to Jesus Christ, to his mission, and to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So consider your relationships with others in our church. We are a family. A family is meant to be connected. It's meant to be a community, a tight community. Jesus died to bring us peace with God and to give us peace with each other. He gave his life to bring a new family into existence. He has put us on the same team. We need one another. We need to work together, helping each other follow Christ. We need to serve him together. We need to live in community with each other. So who are you disconnected from? What group are you disconnected from? Why are you disconnected? Maybe it's because you honestly just don't care that much about that person or that kind of person. And if that's one of your reasons, you just need to repent of your indifference of what's really lovelessness and then decide that you are going to start pursuing that person in love. Maybe what's keeping you from being connected with someone is that you've hurt them in some way in the past and it broke the relationship. If that's true, you need to go and you need to apologize, be reconciled to them. You need to make peace. Maybe it's the other way. Maybe they've hurt you in some way. And that's what's created this disconnection. You need to forgive their debt just as Jesus forgave your debt so your relationship can be restored. Maybe it's because they're getting in your way and you're angry with them. Maybe there's this tension in your relationship and that's the problem. You need to remember whose team you're on, Christian. You are no longer on team you. You are no longer here to accomplish your will in life. You are here to do Christ's will. And the people you once thought of as your people are no longer your people, not if you're a Christian. They're no longer your primary community. It no longer provides your primary identity. Your people and your primary identity and your central way of life needs to come out of the gospel. Your people are now your brothers and sisters in Christ, first and foremost. They are your team. Maybe you've lost sight of this and You've let old rivalries supersede your commitment to Christ and to your new team. And so maybe you need to go and apologize to that person or that group, ask for their forgiveness. Jesus says, if your brother has something against you, leave your gift to the altar and go and be reconciled to them. It's coming from a guy who died to bring peace to his church. We can't just settle for a ceasefire. We can't just settle with pretending like everything is okay and having pretend community. We need to make peace. We need to restore fellowship or initiate fellowship. We need to move toward each other in love. We need to ask for forgiveness. We need to extend forgiveness. We need to make peace. What could you do this week or today, to make our church family into more of a place of shalom, into a place of tighter, better relationships. What could you do to help us start to enjoy the blessings of peace and to move together 
as one team in our mission to the world? What could you do to make a difference? May the Spirit lead us to respond to his word with obedience. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would guide us now um, as we think about some of the ways that we have moved away from others, uh, some of the ways that we have been indifferent to others and been fine being separate from them and not really caring about them that much and not pursuing them. We pray that you would knit our hearts to one another as your people, that we would see a need to be a team, a need to be a family and to live like it, to serve like it. We pray that where there is brokenness in our community, that you would bring healing, that you would help us to take the initiative to restore some of these broken relationships, to reconcile with each other, so we might enjoy the blessings of shalom that Jesus wants to give to us. We pray that we would stand out in the world by our ability to forgive even great wrongs and to be reconciled to one another, even though we're not just like each other, but because we are brought together by our shared allegiance to Jesus Christ and by the power of his great love working within us. We pray that you would do something great and amazing in our church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.